Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today in Columbus, Ohio, I'm joined by David Veach. How are you doing, David? I am great, John. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And David's the founder and CEO of Leadership Insights. Uh, he was a 20, what was it, 20 years in the Army as an officer? Yes. And then he's been on the faculty teaching leadership and lean systems at many different uh, universities and taught executive education at Penn State. So he is a writer, educator, um, a consultant, and many other things too. <laughs> just an overall good guy. That's just an overall good guy. Exactly. Uh, and what we wanted to talk about today was, so everybody's talking about, okay, when are we going to get back to normal? When are we going to get back to normal? But David says, don't get back to normal, get back to better. So David, as we're sitting here, we're, well, by the time this goes out, we'll still be in, in the crisis uh, to some degree. What do you mean by not going back to normal, but going back to better? How can you approach that? Well, I think it's pretty clear that uh, normal is, is gone, right? Um, so we could, if we try to go back to normal, we'll actually be regressing performance-wise. Uh, so we'll doing we'll be doing things more poorly than we did them before. So while we're experiencing this new way of working, we're innovating. We're creating new ways to communicate. We're creating new ways to collaborate. We're creating new ways to deliver value. And I'm afraid that if people don't stop and capture what they're doing, when the restrictions are all lifted, they're going to end up abandoning these great new processes that they've developed and end up going backwards in time. So we can't have that. We want them to push forward. Yeah, I think that's a great point though, is that uh, people are being innovative, they are being creative, they are finding ways to be efficient. And there is obviously, as you say, the temptation when when this is over, whatever that means, uh, yeah. that people just want to revert back to the way they always did things, including the inefficiencies. Exactly. I mean, we saw with every major crisis, we've seen this happen. When the crisis goes over, we, we forget all the great stuff we learned and we just go back to the way it was. The, probably the most glaring example is the way we, the way we approached World War II and our, mm -hmm. our production capacity in World War II just went through the roof and we had these fantastic waste-free processes. When the war's over, everybody goes back to work. We changed from military uh, requirements to domestic requirements but we brought all these bad habits back. So we can't afford to do that if we're gonna, we're gonna keep driving the economy the way we need to. So, so what are some of the new habits that people should consider adopting? Well, I think there's great value in this kind of face-to-face -face video conferencing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been trying to, uh, I mean, video conferencing is not new, right? Sure. We've been doing this for a while and people saying, oh yeah, we're gonna replace travel with video. Uh, well, now we've got enough practice and we've got enough best practices captured that maybe we can put a dent in our travel habits and our carbon footprint. So maybe we can use this as a much more relationship-oriented collaborative tool rather than just a functional, let's yeah. get this thing done and go on. Let's, let's build relationships and build trust going forward. Yeah, because it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, we as an organization on, on the Pipeliner side, we have run a, a, a largely virtual company for about six years. And we did it as, and we made a strategic decision to, to do that because we, for a number of reasons, number one, we felt we could find talent wherever the talent was rather than just in your in the radius or force it to come to you. People can choose where they want to live, what kind of like cost of living lifestyle and all of that that they want to have. And to your point is we discovered over time that you can actually build deeper relationships with people that you, that you don't actually physically see. It's quite amazing. I agree 100%, especially since we've been doing this from home too, and mm -hmm. we've been exposed to interruptions by kids and interruptions by dogs. We get to know a little bit more about the people with whom we're working. And that, that is the basis of trust. We've just got, mm -hmm. to, got to make ourselves a little bit more vulnerable uh, and then get better on clearing our expectations. We can build some fantastic trust. But you're echoing the same kind of things I hear from other organizations who have been virtual for a long mm -hmm. time. And uh, 
I, I think it's a habit of some leaders that they really want people in the office, right? Mm-hmm. And I think this has proven once and for all that we can still be productive, we can still be effective, we can still deliver value without being in the office. And maybe our our hours don't have to be eight to five or nine to five. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I maybe I want to sleep in, right? I want to sleep in, but when I get up, I've got the tasks that I've got to do. I'm going to be productive during the day. Maybe I'll stop and take care of the kids for a few hours. And then I'll get back on at night after they're in bed. So this uh, set standard hour kind of thing is, 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 I think it's a true thing of the past now. And this, this crisis has kind of illustrated that for us. Yeah. And, and in full disclosure, I'm, I'm like a reformed smoker in many ways, because when I run organizations, but, and that's why I always have to put in this, this disclaimer in case anybody from those organizations is watching and go, you were totally against people working at home. You're one of those people who wanted everybody in the office. And it's true. I did. Um, but over time, I have completely, and obviously the technology and the circumstances have changed to support it. But yeah, I'm, I've gone, done a complete 180 on it. And I, and I do believe that you, if your business, obviously there's some businesses that you can't do that with. Yes. But if you can, I would recommend you try it because it makes the employees happier. You get greater productivity and you get a better quality of life for everyone. It, it really is. And I think that quality of life is the key thing. Um, what I think people are, are, well, one, I think many leaders use it as a control mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Um, because we do have a hard time as human beings, we need this, this control, right? Uh, and we have a hard time letting go of that. Uh, another thing is, is we think that teams can only be effective as teams when they're together, like on the football mm-hmm. field, in the yeah. huddle. But uh, we've seen that you can huddle virtually. You can still share mm-hmm. the information virtually. You can actually experience team building activities and collaborative activities online as well as you can in present. Um, but I still want to encourage folks, yes, when we can, let's get back together and celebrate all the great stuff we've done. But then let's make sure we remember how we approached work during this crisis and the, and the things we did well. And let's keep mm-hmm. those. And I think it's interesting, too, that you mentioned that that flexibility and maybe this is a good time to start to move away from traditional methods, you know, where everybody has to be working at the same time, uh, because there's a lot of things that can overlap and people can pick. You can actually end up in many ways, depending on where people are, you can end up with almost a 24 hour a day company if you're more you know, creative in the way you allow people to work. Well. Where are the customers? Mm-hmm. Most of us are, are, if we have a virtual company, our client base is, is around the world, right? Mm-hmm. So now we can actually serve the needs of that global economy um, with more effective tools. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is I, I think to your, your point is you uh, and uh, the good habits and the things we've done well, I think people have had to spend a little bit more time getting organized, a little bit more time figuring out their processes and all of that. And those are things that they should embrace and carry forward. Absolutely. And that's one of the first things that I, uh, I published an article like the, the second day of the crisis I said, here are a couple of things you can do to build your teams and keep your teams connected and things like that. Um, one of the things I want teams to be able to focus on um, uh, while we're away from the office, away from the factory, away from the, the workplace, um, that doesn't mean the problems that we experienced before, that doesn't mean we can't solve them now mm-hmm. while we're away. We don't have to actually be on site to go through the problem solving process to get to where we need to solve those former problems or we need to improve those processes. We can get our teams together. We can brainstorm all this kind of stuff and then we can make a plan. And I think that's where, where you're heading is we got to have a plan. Uh, if we're mm-hmm. going to have people working from home, if we're not going to be able to just kind of walk around the cubicle farm and poke my head in on somebody, I have to have a plan as the leader. What do I expect you to have done today and the rest of the week? And then when we check in every morning, were you able to stay on task? Do you need some additional help? Or is there a problem that we need to help you solve? We can still mm-hmm. do all that stuff. When we lift the things, let's go back and implement some of these great solutions and see how much better we can make our organizations going forward. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I think uh, uh, 
expectations is a huge thing. And I think, to be honest, sometimes when you're in a physical location, everything is just humming along. Maybe business is good. And let's face it, when business is good, we'll put up with lots of inefficiencies and all that. Yeah, but you're in a physical space, you know, you're maybe you just let expectations slip or you're not as you're not as clear in defining things now you have to be you have to be right now clear in defining things you have to be clear in setting expectations and and those are things that should not be dependent on whether you're in one place or the other this should be something you should be doing anyway and i think to your point that's something that people need to keep in mind going forward well the clarity of expectations has always been important Mm -hmm. but we've never been very good at it right and this, um, this environment has forced us to improve that. Um, and, and that's one of those things I don't want to lose when we go back. Leaders have had to make a plan to be more effective in this situation. They still need that plan, even when you're all in the same work environment. So we learn this lesson. Let's keep it up and, and keep working on clarity of those expectations, because that's one of the biggest gaps we have in organizations. And I think the other thing that I think uh, uh, that leaders need to work on now and uh, and help everybody with is the fact that you have to be prepared for eventualities. There are going to be. Let's face it. I mean, if you look back, I came I came to the states uh, 22 years ago. Right? Uh, I came to Silicon Valley, and since I've been here, I've been through the dot com crash. Right. I've been through the financial crash right now the COVID-19 so and these things are happening there are events are happening at regular intervals unfortunately of different times but it means that as an organization you have to be flexible prepare be prepared and be ready to to pivot and, and meet challenges head on and and to your point at the beginning is not to think that you can just go back to a comfortable norm because that's going to that could get blown up at any moment yeah, um, that's that's back to the the plan though. It's it's a whole lot easier to pivot when you have a plan, even if mm. you can't follow the plan. You know, I spent twenty years in the army, right? Yeah, we had plans for everything, but you know, the enemy doesn't care what our plans are. Right? <laughs> so we go out there and we have that plan. We start executing the plan when we encounter some kind of obstacle, some kind of resistance, something we didn't expect. Then we have to adjust, but we still have the boundaries we're supposed to be working in. We still have the objective that we want to achieve at the end, and we still have to find a way then. So it's a whole lot easier for people to pivot from a plan mm-hmm. than to to just, we got to be flexible, so we're not going to make any plans. That's just right. Crazy. Yeah, no, that's that's an excellent point, and I guess also from from your your uh, your experience in the army is that the expected is the unexpected is the thing that you're always expecting, right? Exactly, you got to plan for every eventuality, and, and then <laughs> think through whatever you can, and then you're still going to miss, you know, eighty percent, ninety percent of it. <laughs> but at least we've gone through that critical thinking, and we have taken things into uh, in stock. Now, one of the things that I've also run into. Um, is I spent a lot of time with companies who think they were focused on safety of their employees in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And they really weren't. They were focusing on safety by measuring things like near misses and reportable (laughs) accidents just doesn't give you a good safe environment. And now the safe environment requires that the environment has to be clean as Mm -hmm. well. So how are we going to address those needs going forward? And how are we going to measure whether we're actually fulfilling our responsibility and our obligations to keep our workers safe. And if we can't do that in one workplace, then we got to stay virtual. And and that might not be a bad thing either. Yeah. And I think the other thing, obviously, in uh, you're going back to um, your time in the army, obviously, when you're when something is happening or an event is happening, the, the communication is key, right? That you're getting the information to the right people and you're getting the information back from the right people. And I think in an organization, It's the same. I mean, right now it's the same, but going, but even like going forward, you have to be constantly communicating and making sure that they're making sure the message is getting out to everybody and everybody understands. Because I think that's one of the big issues people have today during the crisis is that there's so many mixed messages you can, that you can, wherever you sit on the spectrum of what you think about which, what should be done right now, you can find some message to back up your point of view, but so can the other person equally. And so everybody, everybody's so confused right now. So I think organizationally, like the communication is critical. 
Well, communication, effective communication doesn't really depend on the tools that you have mm -hmm. or how frequently you contact. The most effective thing that, um, uh, the most important thing that affects effective communication uh, mm -hmm. is trust. If yeah. I don't trust you, you can tell me whatever facts you want to tell me. I'm just not going to believe you. So we've got this obligation to continue working on trust and trust. It's not. It's not all that complicated, but it's not all that easy either, right? Yeah. Um, the two key things that are going to build trust in organizations, we've already hit on the expectations part. The clearer we can communicate our expectations, and that requires not only our ability to tell you what I expect of you, but it's my obligation to listen to what your expectations of me are, right? So mm -hmm. I've got to get that clarity going both ways. But then the person in the power position, which is usually the leader, that person then has to step step out and make himself or herself vulnerable to the performance of the rest of the team. And they have to know that you're vulnerable to their performance. And with that combination of vulnerability and clarity of expectations, we can build those, those trust foundations. Now, on a national scale, I wish I had some answers to that. Perhaps I could you know, make a killing solving that problem, but I can't do yeah. that. Well, unfortunately, it's not just national, it's national, it's regional, it's local. I mean, That's this, true. the one thing that this has shown up, uh, I tell you clearly, is that very, very few people are good communicators, as far as I can see. There's a big gap there. I did, I'm not going to name names, but I, I did listen to something the other day, uh, and I, uh, there was one thing that everybody wanted to find out from this particular announcement. 20 minutes in, the the person who was making the announcement had waffled all over the place that you were literally just screaming, just say, just get to the yes, point, yes. just say it, say it, whatever you're going to do, just say it. <laughs> well, and I'm always surprised to see how many people think that they're effective communicators. Yeah, because exactly. they're just not self-aware. So we've got to, We've got to work on that as well. How can we keep leaders aware of their own weaknesses, particularly with communication? And that's the number one thing people complain about anyway. On, on every employee survey you've mm -hmm. ever had, it's always been, well, they just don't communicate it. Well, yeah. You know, I can communicate perfectly, but the information might be imperfect. I can communicate imperfectly with perfect information and still not get the point. So it, it falls back to that relationship that I have with people. And if I've got a good trusting relationship, I don't have to have all the gaps filled because we're going to cut each other some slack and we're going to think, well, I, I know that you've got my best interest in mind. So I'm going to, I'm not going to fill in that gap with some kind of BS, which is what humans are very good at. And the you know, rumor mill is a wonderful tool, right? Yeah. We've got this fantastic capability as people to fill in gaps of information with whatever the heck we want to say. Yeah. yeah and it's, and to your point, I mean, even in a, in a time like this, I mean, I know in, in our company, the CEO and myself, we do a weekly video that we goes out to the whole company, right? It's a, it's a bit like this. It's a 10 minute uh, chat and we, and we invite questions in from people and we ad address them. But I think to your point is like, we don't pretend to have all the answers because that would be stupid because we're in a situation where you couldn't possibly have all the answers. So when yeah. people say like, what's going to happen? We have to say, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Here's what we are preparing for. Here's what we think might happen. Here's how we're addressing the things that we do know, but we're not, we're not pretending to have answers to questions that we couldn't possibly have an answer to. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great strong approach. I do have a question for you though, John, have yes. you been able have you been able to um, assess the impact of the difference between communicating using the video versus, late, let's say, sending an email out to everybody? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think absolutely. I mean, the video, the video is people really appreciate because number one, I mean, regardless of whether you could put five hours into an email, people will never give you the credit for that. They'll never say, that was the best, most well-written, well-thought-out, well-laid-out and formatted email I've ever seen, right? They're just like, people just, to be honest, people just see emails as kind of throwaway. Like, yeah. um, and plus, plus, some people are good at reading, some people are not, some people you know, have, are distracted. With video, at least, and especially when you've got the two, two people on it, at least, it's like, you know, everybody's kind of listening in on a conversation and it's much more personal. It, it really is. It resonates more 
vulnerability and it resonates clear expectations when you're bouncing mm-hmm. off of each other yeah. to make sure that you understand what the real message is. Yeah. I think it's very important. Yeah. So, and plus you can see, I mean, you can see that we're not like, you know, unshaven with long beards and unkempt hair and everything's a mess and we're in a bunker going, ah. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen some videos that have been that have surfaced the people in suits and jackets with no pants. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, and not realizing that the cameras panned out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we ever going to be able to work with shoes on again? I know it's 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 quite incredible. Well, listen, David, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of David's information will be in his contributor bio along with this, so you can find out more. But but please, before we go, do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do and how they can learn more. Well, I spend most of my time now trying to help leaders perform better. Um, I want leaders to be more effective. And a lot of that is is making them aware of the gaps in their own performance and then helping them set goals to take those next steps and build plans to actually achieve those goals. I do that through personal coaching. I do that through workshops. I have workshops where I play with lots of Legos to illustrate certain key points and and build collaborative teams. Um, So and I'm trying to write more as well. So I've got a couple of books already. I'm working on a third. So follow me on Twitter and I'll tell you all about it. And when do you expect the third book? To um, be done? I'm hoping to have it done by the end of this year. Um, okay, excellent. excellent. I, I hope though, is, and I know that's not a really effective strategy. Uh, <laughs> the last book it was three years late to the publisher. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be a little bit more disciplined this time. <laughs> excellent. Well, as I said, I recommend you, you know, check out David. And I think uh, with all that experience in the army, where, hey, let's face it, you know, the army knows better than anybody about when th- things come out of left field, right? <laughs> or when you're expecting them out of left field and they come out of right field. <laughs> well, we, if, if we build the basic skills, we can respond to anything. That's, that's yeah. pretty key. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you very much, uh, David. Thank you all for jo- uh, joining in. And we will see you for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.